October 1st, 3112, about six years later, Mongolian Highlands, Earth. The evening breeze was cool tonight. I pulled my large fur-lined hooded cape up and around my shoulders a little more snugly and shifted myself on the rocket I was using as a stool to be closer to the fire. My camp was in the shallow gully area between two low ridges. This put it in the path of the displacing cooler air descending from the higher elevations caused by the setting sun. Hopefully, after the sun had fully set, the chilly flow would subside as the temperatures of the differing elevations balanced themselves. Spreading out in front of my meager camp were miles and miles of incredible vista. The rolling short grass-covered terrain dropped gradually away over the course of many miles. In the middle of the wide valley lay a meandering river. I could see the occasional cops stretched along its serpentine banks. Those tree and brush stands would have made nice campsites if not for the higher risk of predators. Being more open, the higher elevation swale I was currently camping in was safer. I would have to live with the near silence of the hills as opposed to the tranquil sounds of flowing water. But that minor sacrifice would mean that I should be safer from unexpected visitors during the night. Also, I would not have to worry about the flooding risks of a streamside camp if a sudden rainstorm sprang up. I returned my gaze to the task at hand, which was a large piece of meat on a stainless steel fork skewer cooking over the fire the occasional sizzle of the fat dripping onto the hot embers and the accompanying wonderful aroma had me salivating. Just a few more minutes, I thought to myself as I took a long sip from my ever-present flask. The warmth of the alcohol bit into my throat as it made its way down to my belly. I noted with a frown that the flask was nearly empty. Tomorrow would likely be another cloudless fall day, which meant I simply had to stand in the open and wave the empty flask over my head for a minute or two. An hour or so later, I could expect to see a small package come gliding down from the heavens under a small guided parachute. Carefully packaged in the airmail delivery would be another few weeks' worth of what had become the essential liquid of my simple existence. I was not sure if the small care packages were dropped by one of the dozens of perfectly silent, high-altitude, automated cargo aircraft which were visible crisscrossing the skies each day, or if they were launched and deorbited from one of the low-orbit manufactories which polluted the night skies with their steady moving lights. All I knew, or cared about, was that they usually arrived in a timely manner. If I had to go without my daily ration of alcohol, I'm not sure I'd be able to carry on. My booze drops were about the only thing I depended on from the watchers above. I was stubborn enough to scavenge and hunt for my meals, although I did not turn away the nourishment bars which oftentimes accompanied the airmail liquor. As I mused, I picked at my dirty, long fingernails. In the flickering light of the fire, I noticed my left ring finger's nail was almost completely healed. I'd lost it a few months ago in a rock slide when I'd slipped. When I landed, a large sliding rock had pinned my hand, smashing my finger in the process. I had been lucky that I had only lost the nail. I noticed that my dirty nails were not the only parts of me that were filthy. Tomorrow, I'd have to detour from my slow southward migration to travel closer to the river and take a bath. I hated the idea of the detour. With today being October 1st, winter was coming fast in these parts and I needed to reach a warmer climate before the snows came. Also, there were those predators I'd already mentioned which liked to follow the river. I'd have to be quick and on my toes. Off in the distance, lower down the valley and almost halfway to the river, I caught the flickering glow of another campfire. My regular stalker of the past two months was still lingering nearby. He or she had never gotten close enough for me to speak to, even with a yell, so I was unsure exactly why I was being followed. Whoever was following me was not doing so out of some sense of duty to provide me protection. I had my own ever-present trio of quadruped security units, and they were easily spotted as they patrolled. The mobile sentries maintained a perimeter about a quarter mile in diameter. Once, years ago, the quadrupeds had patrolled much closer. But one night in a drunken rage, I had forbid them to come closer than a thousand feet to my camp. They had maintained that minimum distance ever since and typically stayed even further, probably to keep from pissing me off and banishing them completely. I was not quite that stupid, though, as to forego their protection completely. I inspected the meat on the skewer and, judging it ready, carefully slid it onto my one battered composite eating plate. My belt knife served to both slice off bite-sized chunks and to deliver them to my mouth. 
As is always the case with the hungry, the meal tasted delicious. Due to the lack of any, I had long gotten over the need to add spices or sauces to my basic meals. Dessert would be a still fresh apple. I'd passed a tree a few days ago and loaded up my pack with all its remaining edible, late-hanging fruit. I had a few days of meat left in the cooler bag in my backpack, so a hunting trip would be needed in the near future. Luckily, the flechette rifle had the range to make hunting a low-risk activity. After I had eaten my supper, I sat back on my rock and just enjoyed the quiet, cool evening. A bit ago, I had heard a nearby electrical discharge followed by a snarl. This meant that my automatic guardians were on the job keeping the lions, tigers, and bears away. I had no idea if there were any lions up here in these high steps, but I did know there could be tigers and bears. The tigers were very rare. I'd only seen them three times in the last five years. The neo-tigers were not descended from some now-extinct Siberian ancestor. Instead, they were from a new strain developed using the genetics of the rare survivors in India. Those had been tailored and adapted for survival in the colder climates and had been slowly spreading northward for over a century. The neo-bears were a different story. After heading south during the reset following their food, the old apex predator polar bears had mingled and bred with brown bears. As the world recovered, the bears had spread out, growing even larger in the process. This left today's common bear species a true living nightmare. It could be argued that they were the absolute top of the food chain in this era, mainly because as far as apex predators went, they could easily outpower most tigers and lions. They were also very smart, and my mobile automated guards seldom had to kill the bears as they learned to fear the deterrent weapons early on. Once they had been zapped with the first painful nerve disruption warning shot, they generally avoided being taught a second, more lethal lesson. Still, I came across the freshly killed carcasses of the stubborn predator occasionally. If they were hungry and desperate enough, they would still try to stalk and hunt me. Thankfully, my sentries would prevent that. It happened enough that I had learned which parts of the bears were safe to eat, taking what I could from the carcass so as to not let the remains become a complete waste. I took another sip of my flask and noticed that my long gray beard was stained with a bit of grease from supper. I found my one remaining comb and began to pick at the stringy mess. I got a few of the tangles out and noted that the grease helped tame the wild hair. I noticed the beard extended down to nearly the middle of my chest. Tomorrow when I bathed, I'd have to trim off a few inches. I felt and probed at the tangled mass on my head and decided my hair needed a bit of a trim also. As I thought of doing that job tomorrow by fill and by knife, I felt a rare instance of regret at my self-imposed solitary lifestyle. Too bad there were not any barber stands out here on the Mongolian steps. My folding shovel made short work of the remains of my fire as I prepared to go to bed. The setting moon gave out enough light that I did not need to resort to my worn-looking pair of enhancement goggles. I stood off to the side of the camp to relieve myself and looked at the heavens. It was a clear night, and the many artificial moving stars competed with the fixed natural ones. Off towards the southeast, I saw that Orion was proudly filling the heavens. I noted the bright stars of its boundary corners of the constellation. Those were the stars Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, and Rigel. Next, I paid homage to the three belt stars. The trio in a row were some of the earliest stars I had learned the names of. I smiled as I recalled the old public television channel's short nightly astronomy series. Stargazer was its name, and its host had been a guy named Jack Horkheimer. I had been a kid who loved all things space-related, and his weird TV manner drew me in. For some reason, his show discussing the Orion constellation had caught my attention. From that episode, I had learned the names of the three belt stars, Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka. Funny the strange things we remember. Below those three belt stars was the fuzzy glow of Orion's word more property known as the Orion Nebula. I remembered my fourth daughter's giggle when I had once referred to the sword as Orion's dingus. I shifted my gaze towards the east and noted the other two stars of the winter triangle just rising from the eastern horizon. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, formed the lower right corner of the triangle and the far left corner star was Procyon. I lingered on this last star while a scowl formed on my face. Right now, somewhere near Procyon, but closer and hurtling towards the Earth at 7.5% of the speed of light was our enemy. They would be here in a hundred years or so. I hoped the preparations for their arrival were going well, but that was someone else's problem. I was out. 
Back in my small one-man tent, I stripped out of my outer clothing, noting while I did that my long underwear and undershirt were holding up well. I had to hand it to modern materials. Nothing from my distant past would have held up to the dirt and grime of my current lifestyle as these new fabrics did. I laid on my bedroll and felt that it was already warm. The ground cloth that I slept on was heated and helped keep me warm. A few months after I had begun my nomadic lifestyle, the self-heating ground cloth had been airdropped to me. It worked so well that I dared not complain. Yes, I am a hypocrite. Some things are too handy to do without. Not sleeping on cold ground was one of those things. Before I touched and extinguished the glowing light emitter that formed the spine of the small tent, I dug into my pack for my smartwatch. I did not wear the watch daily anymore, but I did at least check it every few days. As expected, it was filled with a new batch of messages. The normal daily messages from Naomi were quickly erased unread. I then scrolled through the dozens of human-sent messages. These were the typical messages asking me questions, well-wishers, or the simply curious. I deleted these mostly unread also. One of the most recent messages caught my eye and I opened it on a whim. It was short and to the point. Happy birthday, Gramps. Love, Serenity LB. I was puzzled for two reasons. It wasn't my birthday, or was it? Also, who was Serenity LB? I looked at the date and time function on the smartwatch. Tuesday, October 1st, 3,112. No, my birthday was not until October 2nd, which was tomorrow. The message had been sent early. I could forgive this Serenity person for sending it a day early, as I also forgot the date of my birthday often myself. I thought back to previous birthdays which had happened in happier times. I wondered how old I would be tomorrow, close to 1150 years since I was born, and probably over 230 years spent active and awake. I'd have to do the math to be sure, maybe when I had something to write with. I looked into the details of the message sent from the Serenity LB. I noted that the message's geographic origin point was Samoa. That explained it. Serenity was currently in the Western Pacific near the International Dateline. My current location in or near Mongolia, I was not sure, would put me six or seven hours behind her. At her location, it was already October 2nd. I also seemed to recall that my grandson, Ben, had had a daughter named Serenity. It was hard to remember all my offspring. This was not because there were so many. It's because they could come at any point in the life cycle of their parent, regardless of his or her age. I remembered that my fifth child, Larissa, had had Benjamin to celebrate her 50th birthday. Hell, I had even had my sixth child in my hundreds, with Charity Hope being born when I was 130 years old. I pulled out my ever-present amulet from under my grimy undershirt and twisted it active. I continued to cycle the images until I got to the sort function. Once it was set to grandchildren, I spun the list until Benjamin L. Abrams was on the display. I hit the more detente and Ben's family line appeared. There she was. This confirmed that Serenity LB was indeed Ben's first daughter with the L being from my own daughter Larissa and the B referring to my grandson Ben. The thought of one of my descendants keeping up with great granddad's birthday filled me with both joy and melancholy. I was so moved that I did something I had not done in nearly a decade. I sent a reply back. Thank you, G Grandpa John. I came awake in the darkness sometime before dawn. I thought I had heard a distant shout or scream. The night was still and perfectly quiet, and the moon had set. The sound of a faint scream came again. I sat up and listened intently, trying to find which direction the sound had originated. There it was a third time. It seemed to be coming from the direction of my stalker's camp. I quickly got dressed and grabbed my flechette rifle and my enhancement goggles. Seven minutes later, I had already jogged almost a mile down the gently descending terrain. I was panting and breathing hard as I pushed my 60-year-old plus shell to its limit. I ran with a noticeable limp as my lame leg still caused me problems. As I ran, I tried to avoid any potholes or snags which were highlighted in the bright enhanced view provided by the goggles. My three ever-present quadruped sentry units were running with me. One was keeping ahead of me while the other two covered my flanks. They had moved closer than usual but were still maintaining at least 200 yards separation. Ahead, my destination was indicated by an illuminated icon in the enhanced goggle display. I had not caused the marker to appear and suspected that my digital warden had set the pointer to show my stalker's campsite on its own authority. 
I'd have to decide if that pissed me off later, but not now, as it was helping direct me where to run. I stumbled up and over an intervening rise a few hundred yards away from the campsite in source of the screams. Two bright thermal shapes appeared in the goggle images. As I had expected, they were neobears. They were smaller than most I'd seen, possibly older yearling cubs. I pulled up and took aim with my flechette rifle. The range indicator near the aiming reticle was flashing amber, too far for an accurate takedown shot against the monsters. I reslung my weapon over my shoulder and began to move closer. Suddenly, the dark landscape lit up as a large shooting star streaked in from the southeast. I quickly pulled to a stop to see what was going on. The fast-moving smear of light was slowing rapidly as it neared the immediate area. Then it flared even brighter, projecting a long blue-white jet of flame ahead of it as it decelerated even more rapidly under powerful braking rockets. What I first thought was a falling star proved to be a fast-response emergency re-entry capsule. My goggles switched to normal vision as the entire valley was now lit up like daylight under the bright jets. I noted the two Neo Bears rearing up on their hind legs and also watching the heavenly show. There was a loud explosion as the sonic boom the object had created caught up with it and rolled over our location. The boom was followed by the thunderous basso crackling and roar of the long deceleration rocket burn. The sounds echoed and reverberated off the nearby ravine walls and rolled over the wide empty valley. Wow, what a show. The rocket cut off suddenly and the light level in the valley dimmed rapidly. My goggles automatically reverted to enhancement mode. I quickly found the still glowing airborne object and watched as it maneuvered slightly before plunging directly towards the stalker's camp. At the last instant, its still hot teardrop shell split apart and released a dozen smaller objects about a hundred feet over the two bears. Fiery thruster jets on each half of the descent shell sent them soaring off to the east where they crashed into the hillside a half mile away. The objects the shell had released were revealed to be small flying aerial drones. These screamed around in a swarm, orientating themselves for a moment, before spiraling in towards the two neo-bears in the camp. There were many loud reports as the drones reached the bears and detonated. I saw the flashes and splashes of heat in my enhanced display as both neo-bears came apart in a shower of hot blood and gore. Well, that ended the bear threat quickly enough. I was relieved that the bears were gone, but also doubtful the intervention had come in time. The fact that the bears had been active in the camp for nearly 10 minutes after I first heard the screams bowed poorly for my stalker's chances of survival. Still, I resumed jogging forward. Maybe he or she had managed to find shelter in a narrow crevasse or something. Maybe they had a bear-proof portable hut. I didn't get my hopes up. I had gotten to within 200 feet of the carnage when a second aerial object appeared in the skies overhead. This time, the intruder was a high-speed jet aircraft incoming from the northwest. This craft was approaching much slower, and the accompanying shockwave was smaller than the one the orbital re-entry capsule had created. As it approached and slowed, I saw that it was also much larger. I resumed walking towards the camp while simultaneously watching the new visitor aircraft. It had VTOL capabilities as it slowed to a hover a few hundred yards overhead into the north of the camp. From a side hatch, it ejected a small, man-sized object. This new object fell silently towards the camp while the delivery aircraft moved off to land some distance away. I had an idea what the new object was and stopped walking towards the camp, trying to brace myself for what was to come. A small parasail spread out above the new object, and I watched as it vectored itself to land between the camp and where I was currently standing. It dropped in near silence and landed in a crouch, having absorbed the impact of its fall perfectly. As I had expected, it was a familiar, human-shaped android. I just waited as it busied itself gathering and stowing the parasol into a compact pack. Once it had finished that job, it slowly approached to where I stood. The false dawn had arrived, and the brightness to the east now lit the valley enough that I could remove my goggles. I noted the remaining original aerial drones, still circling the area, were now moving away from the camp. The immediate area of the stalker's camp grew quiet once again. John, I apologize for interrupting your peace, the dark gray humanoid android said. It spoke calmly and with a trace of humility. 
I was momentarily taken aback by the machine's tone. I rubbed my face and beard as I wheezed, trying to catch my breath. What the hell was going on here? While I recovered, I studied my old companion. It had changed. It looked six inches taller and appeared bulkier. It had a wider upper body and larger breasts. Breasts? What the hell? It's all right, Omu, I said and then paused, trying to decide how to continue. Omu just waited. You've changed, I finally said. The android did something very human-like and looked itself up and down. Yes, I have modified my physical form. Do you like the changes? Um, tits, really? I asked. What the hell was the AI thinking? I needed more physical space for additional processor gel packs and memory augments. It was this or go with a beer belly. I have found that most human males and a surprising number of females react positively to large breasts. Notice that each has a high bandwidth data port, right? Yes, I see them, I interrupted with a chuckle. Well, you're right that the changes are better than a beer belly. It would have also made the machine look pregnant, which would have been just wrong, I thought with a shudder. There was another long pause. Finally, I gestured towards the carnage of the camp. What the hell happened here tonight, Omu? A grim expression appeared on Omu's illuminated face. Tragedy, John? I am sorry to inform you that the woman camping at this location did not survive. She was killed by the attacking family of Neo Bears. As she was partially eaten, you may wish to avoid going closer towards the incident site. I sighed. I had already expected to hear something like this. What was she doing here in the first place, and why were the bears able to get close enough to kill her? Omu seemed to study me for a bit. Finally, she replied. Her name was Adele Sol Chilean. She was relatively young at only 33 years of age and was primarily interested in history and anthropology. You had been the focus of her studies for the past year. I had suspected my stalker had been something like that. Or maybe a curiosity or thrill seeker. Still, why the hell did she get killed by bears? Didn't she have any sentry units watching her? Omu paused again, hesitating. Christ, Omu! Stop delaying and just answer my damn question! I shouted the smoldering anger I still carried deep inside surging forth. Miss Adele did initially have two sentry quadrupeds acting as sentries. Two days ago, she overrode safety protocols and ordered them to withdraw. She intended to use her personal weapon to defend herself if need be in their absence. What the? Oh, Mo, that's stupid, I said loudly. There is no way someone alone can maintain a proper 24-hour watch against neo-bears or the other nasties out here that want to eat you. Why the hell would she do such a thing? It is my understanding that driven by her fascination with you, Miss Adele sought an invitation to join your camp and travel as your companion. The three sentry units assigned to protect you would not let her directly approach your camp, and since you refused all digital messages sent from her, she grew more desperate with her attempts to contact you. Omu paused but continued before I could again prompt her. Twice Miss Adele tried to anticipate your route and traveled ahead of your path to try and leave physical messages. Both times were unsuccessful as your course varies so widely. Finally, she conceived a plan to entice your aid by appearing to be vulnerable and in distress. It appears that her plan was to order off her sentry units and then to camp as near as possible to you so that you would observe that she was missing her sentries. She hoped to appeal to your sense of compassion and that you would be moved to contact her to inquire about her safety. I began to tremble slightly. I rubbed my own hands together in an attempt to help control my emotions. Earlier tonight, it appears that a group of three neo-bears, a large female and her two older cubs, ambushed her camp. Miss Adele managed to wake in time to kill the mother bear with her personal weapon. The remaining two bears then incapacitated her. She did not survive for long once they began to feed upon her. How long ago? I stopped as I choked on the rising bile. How long since her last recording? I finally managed to ask, hoping like hell that she had not been a follower of Amor Fati. Eleven months, John, Omu said softly. Oh my God. I rubbed my face again, suddenly feeling my exhaustion. Nearly a year. But thankfully there had been a recording. She will live again. A compatible shell is already being ready to receive her stored mind data backup, Omu replied. Still, eleven months. A sentient being with almost a year of uniqueness was gone. 
For what? For the chance that I might notice her. What in the hell? She would live again, but everything for the last year was gone. The replacement Adele would not be the same person that had died here tonight. There was a journal, John. Not all will have been lost. I just knelt down and wept. Omu dared not approach and just stood there waiting like a silent sentinel. The valley around us continued to brighten as true dawn approached. I sat in the early morning sunshine a dozen yards from the stalker's camp. Two more mobile units had arrived at the camp from the landed VTOL. They had assembled Adele's remains and processed the carcasses of the three bears. They then proceeded to dig a compact but deep grave on a low rise nearby. I remained where I sat, just watching as the work proceeded. I was still too numb to help. Finally, Omu approached and spoke. John, if you wish to say a few words, you may do so. Although the events of last night in the burial of Adele are being broadcast to Conscientia in real time, I am filtering out your appearance. In addition, if you do wish to speak, the sounds of your voice will be removed. If you permit, they will be relayed textually and anonymously. No one will know that you are present. I rose to my feet and approached the grave. Adele's body had been placed in a spun polymer bag and now resembled a white cocoon. I cringed slightly when I saw that it was very misshapen. The neo-bears had worked fast. The two mobile units slowly released the attached tethers and the package was lowered into the grave. What could I say? Did I even have anything I wanted to say? Should I speak about this person I never really knew? I wish I had been less self-absorbed. I wished I had noticed earlier. That was all I could get out. After a moment, I just turned and began walking the nearly two miles back to my campsite. It was an hour before noon, and I was back at my campsite munching on my last apple. My empty flask lay on the ground. I had not packed my tent, nor did I feel the urge to travel today. I was still shaken up from the violence of last night and the somber mood of this morning. I was unsure of what I should do, so I just did nothing. Instead, I just sat on my rock and watched the action off at the other campsite. The machines finished the burial, packaged up the woman's supplies and equipment, and removed all traces that her camp had ever existed. Ten minutes ago, the large VTOL cargo transport had repositioned itself closer to the former camp and began to take on the mobile units and salvage. Soon I would be alone once again, but this time without my stalker. Instead of leaving immediately, I noticed Omu walking towards my camp. At first, I wondered why she just did not fly over in the VTOL before I realized that it was probably trying to spare me from the noise and wind. As she got closer, I saw that she was carrying something. I wondered what the little unit was up to. Once she arrived at my camp, I saw that she had two items in her hands. One was a book of some sort, and the other was a small container. Happy birthday, John, the android said as it handed me the container. I considered ignoring her, but curiosity got the best of me, and I took it. Inside was a large frosted pastry. There was a single large candle stuck on top. Instead of a wick or a flame, it had a tip that was sparkling in the sunlight like a diamond. Hell, it probably was a diamond. I began salivating when the smell of the pastry hit my nose. I debated bringing a huge cake with 1,144 candles on it, the number of years since you were born. Or should I bring a medium cake with 235 candles representing the years you have been awake and aware? Even 61 candles, the age of your current shell, seemed excessive. So I decided to round the number of candles down to just one. Again, happy birthday. The filling in the pastry is raspberry. The candle will self-illuminate on your birthday for centuries to come. Twist the top to use it as an emergency light source if needed, Omu explained. The emotions I felt welling up inside shocked me. While I struggled to come to terms with my feelings, I removed the candle and took a bite of the pastry. Oh my, what a heavenly taste. It had been so long. It is regrettable that your special day began with this morning's tragedy. Hopefully, the widely circulated example will serve to prevent such poorly conceived actions by other humans in the future. I trembled again, about to break into fresh tears. This was retrieved among Adele's belongings. It was an unexpected find and due to its almost unique nature in modern society, I wanted you to be its caretaker. The gray android handed me the second item. It was an actual leather-bound book. I opened it to find it was filled with handwriting, actual ink on paper. 
the small script was very precise and written in English. She kept an old-fashioned journal I managed to get out. That was a truly rare habit for a new human to have. Yes, what a novelty. I have fully scanned its contents, and if she wishes it when she is revived, a duplicate will be conveyed to Miss Adele. I estimate that of all humanity, you would appreciate this physical journal the most. I fanned through the pages as I continued to eat my pastry. There were easily 200 entries. Each was short at maybe a paragraph or two, but it looked like they had been recorded daily. I got to the most recent entry. It was longer than most of the others. I began to read. October 1st. I think JP noticed me tonight. Using the magnified scanner, I observed him at his evening cooking fire. I was just able to make out his peering towards my own evening fire several times. JP? Ah, she must have referred to me as John Prime. He knows I am nearby, and by now he must have noticed that I am without a perimeter sentry watch. Hopefully soon he will attempt contact and offer to help. I'm so excited. Wouldn't it be amazing that we finally meet on his birthday? Also, I observed that he only drank twice today and that he spent a bit of time grooming his beard and hair. That is a good sign that he has retained enough sanity that I can achieve a meaningful dialogue with him. I can't wait. I let the book fall shut and drop from my fingers. The pastry I was chewing suddenly became tasteless and I wondered if I was going to throw up. I carefully put the remaining uneaten portion back in its container. My hands were shaking severely. Well then, John, I will be departing the area now. Is there anything I can do for you before I go? Omu asked. I looked up and just stared at her. What had the android just said? I was distracted thinking of what I had just read. One part of the journal entry kept repeating in my mind. A good sign that he has retained enough sanity. She had feared that I was going insane. Was I insane? Daddy! 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 I heard repeating deep in my mind. I looked away from Omu as fresh tears filled my eyes. What was I doing out here? Why were people still dying because of me? The emotions I had been barely suppressing burst forth like the waters through a broken dam. I was racked with sobbing. I caught Omu moving forward to comfort me before she caught herself and pulled up short. She slowly backed away to where she had been waiting. Why had I been so irritated with the android? Damn her to hell. Did it really matter anymore? I realized I was completely broken. Totally insane. Oh, Moo, I moaned. Help me! Almost instantly, I felt the android wrap her arms around me as I sat there and shook. As I had noted long ago in the past, I was amazed at how warm and soft her mechanical arms were. I was also cradled in her new large bosom. They were also soft and warm, almost too comfortable. I want to go home, I sobbed into her embrace. I will help you, John. An appropriate aircraft has been summoned. I will have you home shortly, she whispered, brushing my dirty and unruly hair out of my eyes. I continued to weep and was having some trouble breathing. Would you like a sedative? She asked softly. I was able to nod in the affirmative and soon felt a cool sensation on my neck. I knew how fast her sedatives worked and I was surprised when I heard the shriek of an approaching high-speed human-rated transport before I fell asleep. I was still sane enough to deduce that she had probably had the aircraft waiting on standby nearby, just in case. You can't outthink the machine, I thought to myself with a combination of irony and more than just a bit of bitterness. It suddenly occurred to me that it was likely that there had always been an aircraft waiting nearby on standby. I felt myself slumping as I began to fall asleep. Omu gently helped me lay back. I will take care of you, John. It had been nearly a decade since I had felt and heard the buzz of the implant's more intimate form of direct communication. I was not sure whether to feel further violated or deeply comforted. I realized that it had probably been necessary due to the increasing noise of the approaching VTOL jet. It still bothered me for some reason, but I stopped fighting to stay awake and let myself slip away.